Welcome back to my channel. The most intriguing military battles. Thanks for tuning in to our special episode once again. And thanks for all the feedback and support that we have received on the previous and the first out of three parts in this series. See the link in the description below. Today, we continue our exploration of Napoleon's last campaign. And having spent the first part of this episode discussing the French invasion into Belgium, we are now in a good position to examine two major battles, which cumulatively were hardly smaller than Waterloo itself, the Battle of Ligny and the Battle of Quatre Bras. As you may recall, attacked by Napoleon, the Prussian commander von Blücher decided to make a stand near the village of Ligny, and reassured by Wellington's commitment to offer the Prussians assistance, the old general began preparing for the battle, the Battle of Ligny. The trouble was that in order to offer assistance to Prussians, Wellington needed to be in control of the road that would take him there, the Nivelles Road. See, we're back to roads and crossroads, and the vital intersection called Quatre Bras, which became the strategic key to victory. If Wellington controlled it, he could move his troops swiftly east and attack Napoleon's west flank an outcome that would mean almost certain defeat for the French Army de Nord. On the other hand, if Napoleon held Quatre Bras, the Allies would remain separated, as there is no good road that could connect the two armies. This would allow the French to defeat the Prussians first and then turn on Wellington. From Napoleon's perspective, once the Prussians and the English were out of the picture, the Russians and the Austrians may be inclined to make peace with him. As it happened, the Allies got to Quatre Bras first, sending 4,000 Dutch troops, which were really Germans in Dutch service, to hold this vital intersection. Clearly, the Allies underestimated the importance of this crossroad, because Napoleon dispatched the bravest of the brave, Marshal Michel Ney, with 40,000 troops to capture Quatre Bras and hold it at all costs while not allowing the Anglo-Dutch troops to get through. The plan was genius, and it almost worked, if it weren't for that pesky reverse slope. Unlike Napoleon, Marshal Ney had the pleasure of fighting Wellington in 1810, at the Battle of Bruchacho, and was thoroughly defeated. Back then, Wellington used this reverse slope trick to his advantage. To put it simply, Wellington liked to position his troops on the opposite side of the hill, which was hidden from his opponent. And he did it to Ney in 1810, placing his skirmish infantry on top of the hill in such a way that only they were visible to the French troops, who were steadily and confidently climbing up the hill. Since British and Portuguese troops were positioned on top of the hill, Ney had no way of seeing what was happening on the reverse slope behind the line of skirmishers. And Wellington knew that. As French troops approached the top, two British battalions that were previously concealed from French troops, and more importantly from their artillery, unleashed a devastating volley, followed by a bayonet charge, which sent the French into retreat. Marshal Ney didn't forget that lesson. And as he approached Quatre Bras on the evening of June 15th, he was not about to repeat his mistake, fearing that he might find the entire Anglo-Dutch army concealed on the other side of the gently rolling hill. By the morning of June 16th, the French had almost 40,000 troops to overwhelm only 4,000 Dutch troops and take Quatre Bras. With this important crossroads in Napoleon's possession, the Anglo-Dutch army wouldn't be able to intervene in the upcoming battle with Prussians. Except that Ney hesitated, missing his chance to capture Quatre Bras in the afternoon of the 15th, or the morning of the 16th of June 1815. And by the time Napoleon practically forced him to attack, it was too late, as Wellington arrived ahead of his troops, which continued to increase in numbers throughout the day erasing the initial massive superiority of the French. As the Battle of Quatre Bras got more intense throughout the day, Napoleon sent 22,000 men of the First Corps under the command of Count d'Orlon 
to assist Ney. Wellington was a great defensive general. The problem was that at Quatre Bras, he was denied one thing that he was particularly good at, the choice of battleground, a privilege which often comes with a defensive position. I think that Wellington instinctively avoided being on the offensive, since it was simply more costly in terms of soldiers, and unlike other European countries, Britain never had a large army, and Wellington had to be very careful in preserving numerical strength. The fighting took place south of the Nivelle Road, where two stonewalled farms, located within the battlefield perimeters and controlled by the French, presented a large problem for Wellington, as his soldiers were in the direct line of fire coming from these farms. Wellington learned his lesson well, and would not miss the opportunity to apply his knowledge just two days later. This battle ended inconclusively. At the end, the French found themselves in the same place where they had started the battle, while preventing the British from moving east. The cost of this stalemate was high, with the Allies losing 5,500 soldiers, while the French lost 4,400. In the afternoon of the same day, just six miles southeast, Napoleon himself engaged the Prussian army near the village of Ligny. Blucher managed to assemble an impressive force of 76,000 infantry, 8,000 cavalry, and 224 guns, which faced 58,000 French infantry, 12,500 cavalry, and 210 guns. To be fair, Napoleon's troops were more experienced, and the precision of his guns were generally superior to those of the Prussian artillery. After ignoring Wellington's suggestion to position his army on the reverse slope of the hill, see, we're back to that reverse slope business, Blucher's infantry was clobbered by deadly accuracy of French artillery, and despite the number of brave counterattacks, the Prussian army simply could not measure up to Napoleon's veterans, who kept up a relentless pressure. Blucher was still waiting on Wellington's help, who was stuck fighting at Quatre Bras. Napoleon was also waiting on assistance from Marshal Ney, who missed his chance earlier and now had to fight an increasingly growing Anglo-Dutch army. Realizing that Ney was stuck, Napoleon ordered 22,000 men of the First Corps, under Comte d'Arlon, to return immediately and to fall on the Prussian flank. Comte d'Arlon, who was almost at Quatre Bras, had to turn around and march back to Ligny to help Napoleon. As Derlon approached Prussian troops, he received yet another order, this time from his direct superior, Marshal Ney, to return back to Quatre Bras immediately. Derlon obediently turned around and once again marched back to Quatre Bras, continuing this French military farce. He arrived there after dark, once the battle was already finished. And we're back to the issue of communication. Could such an unforgivable mistake have happened if a real pro, like Marshal Berthier, had still been Napoleon's chief of staff? I do not believe so. Although, Wellington didn't even have a chief of staff. So, the responsibility ultimately rests with Napoleon. Realizing that no help was coming, Napoleon resorted to his ultimate weapon, the undefeated Imperial Guards, who did what they had always done and pushed back the Prussian army, winning the Battle of Ligny. One of the most amazing accounts of this attack was left to us by Charles Francois, captain of the 30th Regiment attacking Ligny. Here's the quote. Within 200 yards of the enemy line, our regiment took up a battle order while still on the march. This, by the way, means that the battalion went from marching in a column to a line, and they did it without stopping. This is an example of exceptional training and discipline. Here, a pause may be warranted. The entire Waterloo engagement often reminds me of a game of rock, paper, scissors, just meaningfully deadlier. An infantry could attack in three formations, column, simple line, and skirmish line. A commanding officer could be more or less sure that if an infantry marching as a column more like a rectangle moving long side forward, 
is to face artillery, it would be annihilated, as it presents an easy target. A typical French column was represented as a 60 by 17 infantry formation. Similarly, if the column is moving towards a line, the simplest infantry deployment, it is also likely to be in trouble, as the line has much more firepower. Since most of the soldiers are able to fire their muskets, as compared to a column, where only the first two rows and some of the soldiers on the sides of that column, less than 30% of the total firepower, are able to fire at the enemy. That being said, the line would invariably lose to a cavalry charge, which in turn would be devastated if the infantry was able to square up and form a defensive square, whereby the first two rows of soldiers formed a hedge using their bayonets, while the third and sometimes fourth rows were firing on the approaching horsemen. The ability to change the infantry formation on the go speaks of the superb agility of the attacking army, an element which helped the French to overwhelm the numerically superior Prussian forces. In a last desperate counterattack, led by the aging marshal himself, Blucher was trapped under his dead horse, only narrowly escaping death, with bruises and an unshaken confidence. Yes, Ligny was a victory for Napoleon, but the extent of it was not clear in the failing light of June 16th. If Prussians were beaten badly enough to convince them to retreat east, back towards Prussia, the victory would be as good as total. If Blucher decided to stay in the fight and retreat north, he could regroup and eventually link up with Wellington, so the coalition could live and fight another day. They didn't call the old man Marshal Forward for nothing. His army was defeated, but not destroyed, and Napoleon failed in his objective to annihilate the Prussians. The Prussian army was likewise bruised, but in good spirits. The army was meaningfully smaller, losing 16,000 killed, wounded, and captured, with an additional 8,000 deserters. On the bright side, the Fourth Corps, under the command of General von Bulow, was not part of the Battle of Ligny and remained in perfect order. The Prussians clearly did not achieve their objective of the utter destruction of Napoleon's army, since Wellington never showed up. But neither did the French reinforcements under Jean-Baptiste Duret, Comte de Long, wandering aimlessly between Quatre Bras and Ligny. Wellington prevented Marshal Ney from attacking the Prussian right flank, but with the Prussians temporarily in retreat, Wellington knew that he had to abandon the now famous crossroad, which on June 16th saw as fierce of a struggle as did Ligny. That battle also ended inconclusively, with French troops failing to take advantage of their initial numerical superiority. The French, on the other hand, did prevent Wellington from extending the helping hand of friendship to the Prussians. As Napoleon's army was ready to march to Quatre Bras to join Marshal Ney's troops, Wellington knew that he had to retreat and buy some time, in hopes that the Prussians, having regrouped, would find a way to join him to fight Napoleon together. Thus. In the very early morning of June 17th, Wellington began his orderly retreat. The orderly part is the one that bothered me the most. The French troops were right there cooking their breakfasts and could and should have harassed Wellington's retreat from Quatre Bras. Yet, all was quiet in the French encampment. This negligence by Marshal Ney simply has no explanation. At least, I was not able to find it. Was he that confident that the British were finished, that he gave himself a few extra hours of beauty sleep? Be that as it may, only when Napoleon arrived with the main army did the French pursue the retreating Anglo-Dutch army, but by then it was already way too late. Tu as perdu la France, you lost France, Napoleon famously exclaimed to Marshal Ney, when he realized that the bravest of the brave simply allowed the enemy the most gentlemanly exit anyone could hope for. Napoleon's behavior that morning was hardly better than that of Ney. He too slept in, and woke up in a jovial mood, with no traces of urgency to pounce on the retreating English army. I am convinced that if both Marshal Ney and Napoleon coordinated an attack 
just when half of the British troops were already departed, the remaining half would have stood no chance, which would have spelled the end of Wellington's participation in this campaign. With no Wellington in the picture, Blucher would have gone back to Prussia. But enough what ifs. None of this happened, and the Anglo Dutch army retreated with limited harassment. Terrifying weather notwithstanding. At least the French general staff had a leisurely breakfast. One costly croissant, I must say. Next episode, we will pick up right here with Wellington in retreat and explore the Battle of Waterloo. Thanks for taking the time to watch the most intriguing military battles, and take care.